Hi everyone, welcome to week five. I'm sure you guys are all glad to be on this side of the midterm. Um, we're kind of in the home stretch of the course, uh, so this presentation will be quick because I just want to set you guys up for what you guys are learning this week. Um, one of the things that you're excited about, I know, if you haven't already jumped to it, is just getting into starting getting started with vectors. Um, I'm having you read some chapters from your book that talk about vectors, and today I'm going to talk, set you up and talk to you uh, about some different tools and different things you can use for vectors. Um, most likely you'll be using vectors for logos. Some people logos. Some people will use them to develop their gradients for their backgrounds. Different things like that. Um, but anyways, and then and then we're. I have the extra credit. Uh, the topic is is also within the title here. Practice makes p pixel perfect. So that um, that video that you guys are going to be watching with that isn't the things that you'll be learning from it isn't solely just you know bitmap pixels um, so it also would apply to all things graphic design and web design so I hope you guys enjoy that um, again I look forward to learning with you guys in the course this week and so let's go ahead and get started um, now that we have once started in week three you know we, we launched into the the designing and developing phase of our project it's always very important to remember that over on the right hand side of this process we have this feedback loop and it's important to know that as you are in perhaps the development phase or the design phase or uh, different phases the things that you're doing there is all based on the feedback that you've received in previous phases and then when whatever phase you're in whenever you're working within that phase it's always based on what was discovered and what you learned from the previous phases um, so keep this in mind. Um, it's very important to know that when you guys get into a larger firm, most likely you are going to uh, be working with a team of individuals where all these phases are happening perhaps in tandem. You have a team of people that are working on the analysis portion. You have uh, probably salesmen that are doing the planning portion or strategists that get together with the clients and, and strategize and get things working. And then maybe you're on the design team and you are mocking up things and getting things ready for the developers who are then doing more you know, back-end type work. So I'm hoping you guys are truly um, wrapping your heads around this process and seeing how it would be used in the real world. Uh, this week in particular, you guys are probably going to be, like I said, developing vectors, uh, doing some more fun things with your site in terms of CSS. And it's important for us to remember uh, this is just a saying that if you guys take the, this course with me face to face or any other courses with me you'll hear me say things like don't put your cart uh, before your horse. What this means is uh, sometimes I have students that just jump in and they start uh, like doing things before they're ready to do it because it's important to know within our process there are certain things that have to be done uh, before you can start just creating a logo. For example, like here at the end of this video, I'm going to be chatting with you about a process that you could go through to create a logo, and I have a reading in the course that's going to basically that, that I think is a great way to model that for you. But it, back to what I was saying, you know, don't put your cart before your horse. Sometimes people just jump in, they start developing something before they actually have done the planning and analysis for it. So hopefully, everything that you're doing up at this point is all based on what you guys did theoretically, what you guys did. Uh, when you took 2150, um, or at least what you guys did in the first two weeks of this course. One of the things to think about during development is, of course, your file structure. Um, as feedback that I've given you guys uh, individually up to this point, uh, it's important to know that we are always supposed to be using things like descriptive file names. Having a descriptive file name will help other web designers work with your code. Okay. Uh, so that's a way to make your code efficient so that other people can go in and work with it. Uh, many of you are commenting your style sheets, which helps with organization. Uh, many of you perhaps are using uh, an IDE that does some of the for formatting for you, which is great. Um, or maybe you're doing the formatting in the code yourself. But the key is to make your code very readable so that other people can can use it. And and also, like Becca was saying about descriptive file names, you know, imagine if all of your all of your pages were labeled page one, page two, page three, page four. You know, that's not descriptive in that it would be difficult for someone to jump in and know exactly okay what is what is actually on page one. You know, things like that. 
Um, and that also goes for, for images as well, being you know a short little description of what the image actually is. It's a site logo, call it the site logo. Um, and then also in descriptive file names, think about it in terms of uh, if, if you have images that you've downloaded from somewhere else, maybe those images have a whole bunch of numbers and other junk in them, you know, go ahead and take that stuff out and just give a descriptive file name for the purposes of your site. Um, in your file names, never use spaces, special characters, capital letters in your file names. That's, that's basic something that you guys learned when you took 2000 uh, a, a year or two ago. And then, uh, as a suggestion, as this file structure is shown over here on the left-hand side, you know, keep your file structure neat and tidy. You know, have all of your main site pages at the root level, and then have organizational system set up for all of your scripts, perhaps in an include folder, all of your images in an images folder, an IMG folder, something like that, because uh, we don't want this to just look like a messy bedroom or something. Um, and then. Uh, as a reminder, make sure that your entire visual design for your whole site should be controlled uh, with an external style sheet. That will allow you to make changes to the visual design and to some functionality all in one spot, and those changes will take place uh, site-wide. So make sure that you think about these things in terms of development. And here I have a uh, a decorative graphic, more about different types of graphics in a minute, but this decorative graphic we saw uh, last week in terms of talking about uh, layout and typography. Um, but let's think of this in terms of, you know, an image. Uh, an image, perhaps, you know, I don't know if you want to say that it's uh, the secret sauce, maybe, or, or maybe it's the cheese of the burger, but I mean, an image is considered a very key piece of content. I mean, there's different types of images, um, which we're going to talk about in just a second. But, I mean, aside from the text content, which the text content really would have to be, like I said last week, the actual the, the meat, uh, the burger. Um, but so images maybe would be the cheese, secret sauce. I mean, it's really up to you and how you want to uh, envision that. But it's really a key piece of the burger. And it's basically this whole burger that this whole package is what you're giving to the client and serving up to the user essentially. Uh, so we need to make sure that we put a lot of time and effort thinking about our images because if you just, I mean imagine if you had this, I don't know, uh, just the perfect burger but then you had the wrong type of cheese on it. It's just not gonna, it's just not gonna work. Okay, I'm sorry I'm, I'm making you guys hungry. Um, but uh, the cheese is a very key, a key piece just as like an images are a very key piece. So um, when we talk about uh, web page graphics, as you know, the first half of the course we've been kind of uh, learning about bitmaps from your readings and you guys have all been doing um, bitmap development, uh, but now we're getting into the use of vectors and there's uh, different uses and reasons why we would use vectors, but it's important to kind of know uh, some differences uh, in those two and what we would use them for. For example, bitmaps, you know, photographs like I said, vectors are going to be things that you would use for like your logos, uh, gradients, perhaps line art, different things on your site. Uh, for example, if a, if a company comes to you and says, hey, I already have a logo, and it's and you, you know that it's a, a specific file type that you know, like maybe it's an AI file, and you know that it's going to eventually be transitioned into a ping or something like that, but then you know that that vector, you know, it can be blown up to being a million times its original size. You could essentially use that for a billboard on a street. And it's not going to look pixelated at all uh, because that's the power of vector. Vector is not going to have as many colors, um, but those colors are based, basically a mathematical equation that's filled with filled with that color. So when we use programs like Illustrator or Inkscape to create these vectors, you know, um, they're not as realistic looking per se as something like a photograph. But that's not really the purpose of it. The purpose of it is just to, you know basically this symbol this. Uh, this shape, something, some kind of design on the site. And the power of it is that it can be, it's very scalable. You can use it for different different sizes and it's going to work and look great and it's not going to uh, not going to have issues with lostness and things like that like you have with photographs if you to make them too big or stuff like that. So, and then in terms of properties, here, you know, pretty basic in terms of bitmap as you know, uh, in terms of the, the bit and, and the colors and then you were limited on colors with vectors, um, 
and then different raw formats the raw format is that's like the format that you're using when you're creating it on yourself within your uh, your vector programs or your image programs your image editors and then the output format the best web quality that would be the format that you would actually serve up to the user because if you were giving them the raw AI file obviously if a user doesn't have Illustrator on their computer then they're not even going to be able to view the, the file in the browser or if they get they access the page the browser would then prompt them to download the AI file or something like that um, and plus those those raw files are going to be very 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 large I mean sometimes depending on as many layers and different things that you have and we're, we could be talking you know um, 25 megabits I mean I, I mean it's megabytes I mean it's li literally very very large um, think about it in terms of uh, a graphic that would be used for a billboard imagine how large of a file size that would be you couldn't even email to someone um, so yeah you're gonna have to produce it then uh, in the best web quality for the users and um, in the videos that I have set aside for you guys to watch this week you know it'll talk about out outputs and do you want to use a ping 8 do you want to use a ping 24 things like that um, and then the smallest file size uh, suggested would be uh, for bitmaps you know of course a JPEG a low quality JPEG or a vector you know maybe like a low quality GIF I mean for someone's simple small logo maybe that would work just fine and then of course the worst thing that you could ever do is if you take a vector and then compress it as a JPEG or if you take a, a, a photograph and compress it as a GIF I mean it's gonna look terrible <coughs> excuse me so bitmaps as you know uh, just like if you were to look at this image of a mountain over here on the left hand side but then you were to zoom in you know a hundred times you know you get down to the actual pixels right that is what a photograph is made up of of all of these different bits all these different pixels and then of course the world's favorite vector would be the Nike swoosh uh, this is a symbol that is filled with white and then I've just placed this uh, this mathematical equation that's filled with a solid color here on this uh, here on this black background um, so think about it and that's another thing you know with these symbols you know uh, they're gonna output uh, if you use a ping it'll be able to output with a transparent background and we'll look at more of that in here in just a second but I mean essentially I could take this Nike swoosh and I could you know blow it up on a billboard and it would essentially look just as sharp as it does right here on your screen uh, bitmaps are not going to have that type of functionality so different file types the main ones that you guys are going to be exploring are for as your output would be a GIF, a ping and a jpeg uh, different ones of these as you can see su support animation does that mean you need to be animating things not necessarily um, different ones of these as you can see here support transparency very common so you're probably going to be wanting to use your pings because of their ability to do transparency if that was something that you needed in terms of a logo yes it's probably something that you would need and then here's the different extensions that are available to you although the most common ones are the first ones listed on that list uh, just GIF, ping or jpeg and then whenever you're you're doing figuring out which uh, output to produce these as you can serve them up to the user you know as the quality increases over here on the right hand side uh, as the quality increases uh, it also gets heavier so it gives it a larger size of, uh, so that's why you have to kind of when you're when you're figuring out optimizing your images you know do you want to use a ping 8 or do you want to use a ping 24 you know think about this in terms now now granted you know when you think about it a lot of people the internet speed has internet has you know dramatically improved over the past you know 10 years so you know having you know larger file sizes is is, is is somewhat okay but I mean and most of the average users are gonna have a, you know a 10 10 megabyte you know internet or something like that but then again we you know different sites have different needs you know some of them are mobile some of them you know imagine if you have a mobile site and you think that a lot of your users are gonna be walking around an airport you know they're they're gonna be trying to access your site on a one two meg speed you know internet so um, needless to say I, I always in my mind you should try to go for uh, the best quality that you can get, you know, within the the smallest file size, if that if that's even possible. <laughs> I mean, it is possible. I mean, so that's that that should be the ultimate goal. Um, the best quality that you can get at, with the smallest size. And then this week, 
you guys are probably going to be jumping into the use of Inkscape or if you guys have the Creative Suite you'll be using Illustrator to, to create your vectors. Um, uh, if you have uh, Illustrator, you know, I'm, enjoy it. Uh, it's such a privilege to be able to use a powerful program like that to create your vectors. Uh, now Photoshop now Photoshop does have limited vector support vic limited vector abilities so if you guys are if so like let's say I've worked with students before that just had the money to get Photoshop that's fine uh, it does have vector capabilities now if I had to say you know if you were to uh, rewind you know a year or two when you decide which programs to buy for the average web designer uh, freelancer you know fire Adobe fireworks has is probably the best of both worlds and unfortunately there isn't an alternative a free alternative to fireworks but fireworks is going to have uh, the both of the capabilities to build, do both vector and bitmap but then again to the better programs for those would be to get the the big guns which would be Photoshop and Illustrator but then again a lot of students these days just buy the whole creative suite and you would essentially get all three of these so can graphics be distracting? Well, uh, I'm sure you would answer this as well, 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 yes. Um, you know, I could, I could all of a sudden just throw some random graphic here on this page, and and it, and it would be, it would be distracting you from learning what I'm trying to get you guys to to think about here. Like for example, remember the the different layout images that we used last week. This would be a centered one column layout where the user has. Uh, places to rest their eyes on the left and the right side of the page. But commonly, you know, the left side of the page would be filled up with some sort of navigation. And unfortunately, on the right side of the page, it could be filled up with some sort of advertisement. And as you just see, your eye is now drawn to these different advertisements over here on the right side of the page. I chose to just, now these aren't real advertisements that I found like on Facebook or anything like that. These are just little, simple little images that I threw into this presentation. but. Um, for some reason, I get a lot of advertise. Now, advertisements are often pulled based on your own cached user data that you have within your browser. So, for some reason, I get always tackled with you know, home loan type stuff and finance stuff and credit score stuff. I, I maybe that tells you a little bit about me and my phase and status of life. But um, the point is that yes, these graphics can be distracting. And and now these are advertisements, and they're meant to be distracting. They're meant to draw your eye to it. But Essentially, if you have a graphic on your site that um, doesn't isn't aligned with uh, the, the the purpose of the overall site, then essentially you are, in my mind, you are distracting your user. You know, the, per the heart of the website is its purpose. So we need to make sure that everything that you're doing in your site is always aligned with uh, with the purpose, and then is used to help accomplish either a client goal. Or uh, a goal of the user. If there's ever a, a need for, if you ever feel like you have a graphic that isn't aligned with the purpose, or doesn't help accomplish a a goal of the client or a goal of the user, then essentially, it is, in my mind, I mean, it, it really is just an advertisement. Think of it like that. Just something that's distracting them from getting them to do what they need to do. And you only have seconds for them to make valuations on your site of what. You know, hey, does this site look like it's what it's supposed to look? Does this fit within the mold of the type of website? But then also, is it just overly distracting? Because, you know, I mean, like you're doing a simple Google search of something you're looking for, you go to a site that's filled with advertisements or junky graphics, you're probably going to leave. So, anyway, so now let's talk about some of the different types of graphics. This next little section here is just uh, what I would like to say is just a little slice of life of, of me as. As an instructional designer, um, if you guys remember from the from the intro of myself to the course, you know, by trade I'm an instructional designer, um, and within that realm, you know, that's where I have my my web design experience because often a lot of what I do is I design websites for instruction. So, um, anyways, but in terms of my world, you know, I look at graphics, you know, for very specifically, especially when it comes to instruction and they really should be more than just eye candy. And the following slides I'm just going to be chatting about some different types of graphics and their and their use and, and examples of them. Uh, if, if you're interested in instructional design and you're interested in graphics I would suggest googling more than just eye candy and then write 
put that in quotations and put graphics and you're going to get a really neat article that's written by uh, Ruth Calvin Clark who is going to is a great instructional designer and she's the one that's really paved the way for our field who, who talks about the use of these different graphics and how they should be used and shouldn't be used and different things like that and it's up to us as instructional designers or you guys as web designers or graphic designers you know to kind of know the different principles that are underlying these different types of graphics because subliminally they do lots of different things for uh, the user or the learner in terms of how they interpret and how they learn and uh, how they're able to do and accomplish the things that they need to do. So anyways, more than just eye candy. So there's different types of graphics and I'm going to be chatting with you about um, seven different types of graphics. Decorative graphics, uh, these are just you know basic fun graphics that's really just used there to just as add aesthetic appeal you know a lot of the stuff that you probably see online you know are just there it's like oh we're talking about a burger so I'm going to show an image of a burger I mean, very typical for perhaps a, a Burger King's website you know um, but I mean so they definitely have their use and then we also have representational graphics you know these are graphics that uh, depict um, an object in a realistic fashion in a realistic fashion so if you're training someone maybe you would have like a screen capture or a photograph of of the vacuum cleaner if you're teaching them how to use the vacuum cleaner so it's not just this you know they're not just reading this description they're actually having an image of a vacuum cleaner and says you know hey click here to do this on the vacuum or something like that we also have mnemonic graphics. These are graphics that uh, help them remember different things, uh, specifically probably factual information. I'm going to show you an example of one here in a minute that would help a learner understand the Spanish word for tendor. We also have organizational graphics, so these would be graphics that kind of would help a learner compare two different, two different things. And then we have relational graphics, you know, qualitative relations that show qualitative relationship between two or more variables very similar to organizational graphics but but here we're talking more specifically about you know charts and uh, things to help them understand data and then transformational graphics these show changes in objects over time or space so this is where we would get into having perhaps animations uh, showing different cycles or how to use uh, specific specific types of equipment different things like that especially if you're teaching them how to go through a set of procedures or a process. Like for example, our images for the web development life cycle would of course be a transformational graphic. And then interpretive graphics. These, you know, illustrate um, a specific theory or principle. So they uh, basically, you know, show something that the, the, the user or the learner would then be interpreting and help them understand something. So let's, let's see some of these in action. So in terms of decorative graphics, this is an example that that article I was telling you about uses as an example as a decorative graphic. You know, is it really needed to have this simulated use of uh, the simulated image of a, of a, a computer-generated person, you know, saying, hey, click here. But, you know, definitely maybe that added some um, engaging aspects to the, the learner going through and learning these different things. And then, of course, you remember seeing the, the decorative graphic earlier of the burger, right? Um, that helped you, I'm hoping, understand the whole concept of, like we were talking about this web, the web, web page, the website is like this whole package, and maybe the images would be like the secret sauce of the burger or something like that. So, so maybe that decorative graphic, in, in a way, could be a little distracting from understanding that, that main concept, but in a way, it also grounded you and it gave you a little bit of an engaging piece. Here's the mnemonic graphic that I mentioned earlier where you have these 10 objects uh, standing up around a door, so 10 door to help you understand the Spanish word 10 door. Then here's an example of an interpretive graphic. Um, remember interpretive graphics help you understand different types of data, so this is uh, an example of a simulation where um, learners can manipulate uh, different genes of these different dragons and it helps them understand um, how genes and stuff um, uh, work together to create different things, you know, in terms of science science type thing. I'm not going to discuss that right now. But then remember this relational graphic that we had earlier. Uh, this helped you understand some specific aspects of relationships with the, the different data and talking about image quality 
the higher the higher the quality, the larger the file size. So we, I say all this, and you're like, well, which graphics do I choose? Well, you guys are probably not really sitting here thinking about things like demonic graphics or interpretive graphics, but a lot of our graphics in our site perhaps could be decorative, and it's just important to think about some things because, you know, which graphics do you choose? Well, I'm worried. you need to be worried that maybe if you don't have a graphic, like I was saying earlier, uh, that is aligned with the purpose and helps the accomplish a goal of the client or a goal of the user, essentially it could be distracting. Um, so what's the purpose of a website? Well, that's the heart of the, the heart of the website is its purpose. So it's important to make sure that your graphics are aligned with that. And remember, a graphic is sometimes it could be considered content. Maybe that's something that the user actually needs. And we always have to balance, you know, making sure that we're giving the user what they need in terms of, but then also at the same time giving them a user a good design experience and giving them a user uh, good functionality because that's what the user actually does and when you give all of these things to the user when you serve them up to the user essentially the user is going to be happy because the content is what the user needs so the content could be an image right maybe the user is actually looking for a specific image but sometimes when I'm what I'm more talking about here is just like uh, just random graphics that you have on your page you guys are choosing which graphics to have uh, on your page right now probably a logo um, different other things that are, are, are needed to go on your site um, and that is the content but sometimes it's not uh, it's more these graphics could be more on the design side of things less on the content side of things and we just need to make sure that those aren't going to be distracting because um, there's you know lots of different logos out there right um, lots of money and time and effort was used to create you know all of these different logos and um, we need to make sure that, you know, we're talking about these this week um, in the discussion area and, you know, you guys are working on perhaps creating some for your sites. But we want to make sure, you know, not just the logos, but then other, the other images that you have on your site. You know, we want to make sure that those aren't distracting and they are truly aligned with uh, the purpose of the website. Um, but anyways, in terms of logos, you know, there's things that you should think about you know you guys aren't necessarily graphic designers so you don't necessarily aren't are most likely going to be tasked with the, the task of creating a logo I mean so much money and time and effort went into cr creating a Nike swoosh which we were talking about earlier um, but for the purposes of this simulated experience in this class you guys are you know dabbling into a little bit of making logos, logos and maybe if you were more of a freelancer here in the future maybe you would help uh, a client make make a logo so let's just chat about you know just a brief little process of, of doing so and in the course uh, this week I have listed a, re a reading that that walks through the process of creating a logo and I'm just going to kind of just dialogue and talk about uh, some different steps of, of this of creating a logo just as that article does but I would suggest please go and, and read that I think it's gonna probably it's definitely gonna explain it much better than I possibly could um, but anyways creating a logo so step one learn about the project very similar to what we did here when we were thinking about uh, our web designs. Think about what you guys did perhaps in 2150. You know, your first thing is you just need to learn about the project. And then <laughs> if the client proves the uh, provided estimate, uh, then maybe you can move on. And remember, the client can only pick two. Remember, good, fast, and cheap. We talked about this earlier on in the course. You know, often clients are going to be wanting things uh, good and fast, which means that it's not going to come cheap, right? Um, so, but maybe that's what you're you're interested in. Uh, so the client learns about the client learns about the project. The client approves approves the estimates, and now you guys can get started. So you're going to send them a creative brief. Uh, that's very similar to what we did her here early on in in the course. Uh, we sent it to our executive firm, but essentially think of it as sending it to the client. You know, making sure that they understand, so that you guys are both on the same page. And then a th key aspect in that, perhaps three and four would actually be combined, but you need to do some comparative logo research, especially with you know competitive companies and different things like that. How are their logos looking? We're doing the we did the exact same thing with the sites that you guys are making. Uh, you guys had to think about you know what are common things that are going to be found in competitive websites to the one that you're making, or what are common things that are going to be found in 
uh, similar websites within the similar type. So you compare it apples to apples and you realize, okay, all of the websites similar to what I'm trying to make all have horizontal navigational menus, so you need to make sure that you have something like that in your site, just as an example. And then number five, this is when you finally just start doodling and brainstorming, right? And concept is king, because remember, in terms of a logo, you're probably trying to present some sort of a concept to the to the to, to the viewer, to the user, to the the person who looks at the Nike swoosh. You know, what is that concept that you're trying to get across with that Nike swoosh? Well, uh, that's really should be embodied with with the logo. Um, and then, as the author of the article suggests, you know, let it rest. Think of uh, let it rest. You know, you've done your brainstorming. Let your let your brain let your brain, you know, think about things. Just let it rest and relax, and then come back to it. And then you're soon going to be providing roughs to the client. So just as, think of this as just drafts. And then the key aspect here then is you're going to need to make sure that you provide feedback. And of course, does this sound very similar to the process that we've been doing in this course? Yes, I hope I hope it does. But essentially, you guys you remember this is a simulated experience. You're not really working with, with real clients. And I, I truly wish that you guys were, but I know that you guys will hopefully in, in the future. Um, so anyways, getting feedback is very, very, very key because then you can finally move forward. And then you're going to go through a round of edits, get receive some feedback, refine and perfect. So now let's when in let's say step eleven, you've been maybe you've been mocking these up and just quick and with a quick and dirty tool, and then uh, now you finally get the tool that you, you finally get it to where the the, the the logo to where it kind of needs to be in terms of the concept. But now you really want to perfect it maybe with with more sophisticated tools, spending a lot more time with working with the logo to get it right where you need it. Um, and then, so then you're going to go through a second round of edits, receive feedback, and then if there needs to be a round three, you know. And then, of course, you're going to get client approval. They love it. And then you're going to be giving them the raw files so that they can then take the project and manage it for themselves in the future, whether they want to put it on their website or whether they want to put it on a billboard, things like that. And then finally, the most important pieces would be, of course, you know, the client obviously pays you that million dollars for the Nike Swoosh promptly, and then the client provides you a referral. Very important. Uh, I'm hoping you guys walk away with thinking this, not just in terms of creating a logo, but also as a web designer. Getting those referrals sometimes is even worth more than the initial payment from the original client. Very, very, very important. And to conclude, you know, we, like I said earlier, we're in the development phase, developing these different logos and different things. As you know, keep in mind, this is you know, you are doing the front end right now, and this is largely what uh, this is what the user interacts with largely because this is what they see. This is what slaps them in the face as soon as they get to the site, and they make valuations about their opinions of the site within the f the first seconds of ac accessing a site. Do they choose to uh, continue on, define what they were looking for, or do they hit the back bu button, go back to Google to go somewhere, eventually go somewhere else, then maybe they're going to find what they need. So when you're talking about the front end, you know, thinking about think about the design and the things that specifically we're talking about in terms of you're developing colors, layout, images, etc. And then of course also within the front end piece is you know the functionality piece you know how they experience it are they able to get to where they need to go does the form work things like that um, the creativity comes in uh, more so when we're talking about the design of the site uh, obviously but then also in terms of the functionality as well um, remember that your term project is graded on very specific uh, scale as I show you this every week um, where most likely you know it, it, the term project in, in this course you know Largely, a lot of a lot of students in this core get, get B's and C's, but where I really am excited about is seeing is the students is is just trying to find those that uh, really get that creative piece because truly, you know, how do you how do you know what's creative and what's not? Well, it's it's really determined from the person who seeing it and experience it, experiencing it, and that's really what sets the design apart. That's what sets the functionality apart. That what what leaves the user with that lasting experience that maybe is going to draw them back into the website uh, in the future. And this creativity piece is truly what uh, separates your portfolio from someone else's portfolio. So I'm just trying to get, inspire you guys to jump out there and try to do some creative things with your sites. So 
Let's go ahead and finish up this video by chatting about the different assignments that you guys are working on this week. We're going to be reading chapter 6 and chapter 7 from your Painting the Web book. In terms of the videos, I have suggested Linda videos, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. Um, make sure that you guys, I mean, every single week I plug these Linda videos, and I essentially have no idea if you guys are watching them or not. I hope that you truly are. Um, and then in terms of discussions, uh, we have our pair discussion this week. Uh, you guys haven't done it since week three, so I hope you guys enjoy working with a partner again. But uh, essentially, you guys are choosing, as you remember, you're choosing another uh, element on your uh, your element list that you guys shared in week two to then uh, work on in terms of your site and then share with each other uh, a zip of, of the information. And then you guys can download each other's zips and take a look at it and give each other some feedback. Um, very, very key aspect of this sort of this course. So make sure that you're not uh, blowing this off, and you truly are spending time developing these pieces and getting feedback from your partner in the class. And then I also have a fun discussion this week. I just wanted us to just jump into the web design ledger and take a look at some different logos, examples, and share with the class which ones you think are are most like what you would like to have developed for 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 your site, and then talk to us about why. Um, but just enjoy looking at logos. Maybe they'll inspire you. <laughs> uh, I hope that they will give you ideas for, for future logos that you will be making. Um, in terms of assignments that you actually submit to me, there isn't any this week. And then uh, extra credit. Uh, remember, I have that plug, that video, Practice Makes P Pixel Perfect at the very beginning of this video. Um, I hope you guys enjoy working on that. Let me know if you want to sign up for the extra credit. If you guys aren't doing the extra credit, you know, I would just suggest bookmarking and watching it at a later date, although I would love for you guys to watch it this week. Um, maybe just get in and give it ten, five, ten minutes of your time. You don't have to watch the full 30 minutes or whatever. Uh, get, give it just five minutes of your time just to kind of give yourself an understanding of, okay, there's this resource I'd like to get to eventually. Uh, same thing with the Linda videos, you know. Go ahead and just take a look at the ones that I've suggested for you guys to watch just that you're that are aware that they're there and then maybe um, as you're a problem based learner whenever your problem arises and you feel like you need to know it at least you would have an awareness of what Linda videos are out there and things that you could learn in terms of in terms of vectors so that's why I have suggested you know the de designing the logo series from Nigel French within Linda there he's going to talk about the different types of logos type only logos uh, reg like regular concept logos and then uh, the process for creating those and then in terms of vector graphics um, that is because now that's the kind of our focus is is moving away from talking about bitmaps to now talking about vectors so I have the the, the vector graphics from from Vaughn to watch and then I've also suggested if for those of you who do have Adobe Illustrator you could check out the Illustrator for web design by Justin Seeley and that's going to get you guys into working with layers uh, shapes and symbols and filling the symbols with those different colors. And then finally, as always, I always want to inspire all of you guys to be an observant web, web user. As you're out there looking and poking around the web, you know, seeing what's good, seeing what's not good, spend time thinking about why is it, why is it good, why is it not good. Think about what, you, what that means in terms of what you could do as a web designer. Um, are there things that you'd like to learn how to do every single day? I'm poking around on the internet somewhere. I'm like, wow, how do they do that? And then, you know, you have Firefox. You can then inspect the element or you open up Firebug and you uh, expect it a little bit more in-depthly. And then you just learn right there on the fly. So I hope you guys uh, do that this week. And, of course, you know, let the class or I know if you have any questions. Be sure that you do that in the general questions area. Have a good week.